I go. I, I go where? Okay, not I go, you go. Okay, you go where? India. I don't get it. What? It's not a joke. They're going to India? Who? Oh. March 11th, 1944. You want to interfere with enemy supply lines, but they're hundreds of kilometers away from you, deep in the jungle. You want to send in hundreds of men, but you don't have loads of plane and fuel because you're not considered a high priority. So what do you do? Gliders. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, American forces invaded Japanese-occupied Los Negros. German forces mounted a small offensive at Anzio in Italy. Other German forces began concentrating for Adolf Hitler's planned occupation of Hungary. But things were, for the Eastern Front, pretty quiet in the Soviet Union, as the Soviets were gearing up for a bunch of new offensives. The Soviet 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Ukrainian Front's attacks were set to begin the 4th, 5th, and 6th, respectively, but they really all got going the 4th, the last day of last week. 1st Ukrainian is no longer under Nikolai Vatutin's command, however, for he was badly wounded by Ukrainian partisans February 28th. Georgi Zhukov is currently running that front, and it is apparent that it is not a temporary command. We covered what Vatutin was doing when he was injured and why, and the UPA, Ukrainian Insurgent Army, action that injured him on our Instagram day-by-day -day coverage of the war. So go check that out for details. So, Zhukov's offensive breaks through right off the bat, pushing some 40 kilometers on a 150 kilometer front. Zhukov exerted formidable pressure at the center, throwing in his tank armies and motorized infantry, their mobility much impeded but never eliminated by the mud over which the broad track tanks and Studebaker trucks sloughed and gouged their way. The large bodies of Soviet riflemen did fall behind, marching stolidly through the mud, manhandling equipment amidst the ooze, and fighting repeated infantry actions against German troops trapped in the soft, squelching country lanes or immobilized in the glutinous fields. Glutinous fields. Third Guard's tank army hits the enemy between the flanks of 1st and 4th Panzer armies and heads south. 1st Guard's army advances north of Proskurov, and then on the 5th, 13th army attacks between Lutsk and Dubno. By the 6th, the front between the two Panzer armies has been torn open along a 150 kilometer area. It seems like Zhukov might break out on an operational level, and his attacks reach the outskirts of Tarnopol the 9th, but by the end of the week, units from German 48th Panzer Corps have set up a line between Tarnopol and Proskurov, which they hold even as troops arrive from Poland and even Denmark to shore up the flanks of the Panzer armies. Ivan Konyev's 2nd Ukrainian Front attacks German 8th Army, and Rodion Malinovsky's 3rd Ukrainian Front attacks 6th Army. Uman falls the 9th, and does so literal minutes before an order arrives from Adolf Hitler, demanding it be held to the last. More to say on Hitler's orders in a minute. By today, the whole left half of 8th Army seems to be disintegrating. They certainly have no contact with 1st Panzer Army to their left, and they're being shoved back towards the southern Bug River. As for Malinovsky's attacks, on the 7th, they break through to Novi Bug. Today, as the front takes Bereslav east of Kherson, Hitler orders both 6th and 8th Armies to end their withdrawal at the absolute latest at the Bug. But Red Army units by this time are already in position to cross the river and get behind 8th Army's flanks. Axis forces there may be heading for new lines, but at the other end of the front, they have reached them. Army Group North reached their Panther Line positions last week, actually, but the Soviets don't plan on giving them any rest. North of Pustoshka, two Soviet armies from 2nd Baltic Front are attacking 8th Corps, and south of it, two more are hitting 10th Corps. Leningrad Front has two armies grouping south of Pskov, and further north is sending ever more men across the Narva River, trying to bust out of their bridgehead. However, the German lines are holding all week, and the fronts don't make much actual movement. Here's an interesting Army Group North side note. On the 10th, the army was confronted with a politically unpleasant and militarily insignificant consequence of the disastrous winter. 
The commanding officer of the Spanish Legion and the Spanish military attaché visited Modo to tell him the Legion was being called home. Franco, they said, was not turning away from Germany. He wanted to gather all his matadors about him to resist an Anglo-American invasion. I said a minute ago I'd get back to Hitler's orders, right? Okay, on the 8th, he issues to the Eastern Front a new tactical concept. See, losing a bunch of strategic places and, and the speed of the Soviet advances lately has led him to try something extreme to stem the tide. So he issues Fuhrer Directive 53, which creates specific designated fortress points. The man in charge of each of these points is a senior officer who is responsible directly to the local army group commander and can only be removed by him and only with Hitler's permission as well. Those troops at these fortress points are to do one and only one thing, hold and defend to the last man. And those commanders, they have the authority of a corps commander, which means they can impose the death penalty if they so desire. There's something else about orders and directions here. I said last week that Chester Nimitz and Douglas MacArthur were called to Washington to present their plans and ideas for where the main thrust against Japan is to be developed. We've covered this for the past year, and the Joint Chiefs have avoided taking any sides to avoid stirring up trouble between the Army and the Navy. MacArthur didn't go in person and sent his Chief of Staff, Richard Sutherland, instead. At the meeting, he insists on advancing up New Guinea then invading Mindanao in November and using the Philippines after that as a jumping off point for invading Japan. Naval Chief Ernest King wants to stage such an invasion, but by taking Formosa and some points along the Chinese coast. And he doesn't see much good in doing it from the Philippines. Nimitz doesn't really take any open issue with this, but says that if there is any Philippines operation, it has to fit into his schedule, which is currently take Truk in June, take the Marianas in September, take the Palaus in November. They could speed this up by bypassing Truk now that it has been neutralized, but either way, a Philippine operation could draw off Japanese forces or divide them either, sure, cool, but, and he's very clear about this, since the fleet would necessarily play a large part in any and all of these operations, his operations might be delayed into the typhoon season if the fleet has to also support MacArthur's plans to hit New Ireland and Hollandia. Well. The Joint Chiefs listen to all of this and more, and tomorrow they will issue their directive for what's going to happen next. Their forces are still attacking in the field today, though. Well, this week. On the 5th, the U.S. forces move into the western half of Los Negros and land 1,400 more troops with destroyer support. On the 9th there, the first American planes begin flying out of Momote Airfield. To the southeast, in the Solomons, there is renewed fighting this week. By now, the Japanese have assembled enough force on Bougainville to prepare for a big counterattack. They've spent three months dragging their heavy artillery through the jungle. Harukichi Hayakutaki tells his 15,000 men there can be no rest until our bastard foes are battered and bowed in shame. The offensive begins the 8th with the shelling of the Piva airfield, and the Allies withdraw some bombers. The 9th, the Iwasa unit kicks off the ground offensive from the north. They create a salient, but counterattacks restore much of the line. Attacks the next day are less successful, and in fact today and tomorrow, the Japanese are basically stopped and ground down here, and the Iwasa unit will withdraw. Martin Gilbert writes that over four days, 5,000 Japanese are killed for under 300 Americans. Once more, fanaticism in attack had served only to prolong and intensify the conflict, ensuring that Wherever the opposing forces met, men would die in their thousands on remote islands far from either homeland. It was really the withering American firepower that did it. Mark Still writes that over those four days, over 28,105 millimeter rounds, some 10,075 millimeter, and nearly 14,000 mortar rounds were fired on the Japanese. Well, the Muda unit attacks the 11th, and then the Magata unit attacks today from the east. And as the week ends, they have each made some small gains, but they too are about to be hit with serious counterattacks. But Japan 
is launching a major Fulan offensive this week. Operation Ugo begins the 8th, and with it, the invasion of India, though the border is not yet crossed this week. The aim is to destroy the British forces around Impal and Kohima and then push on through the passes to Dimapur, cutting off the Chinese and Americans in the north and with the road to India ahead. This is begun by units of Renya Mutaguchi's 15th Army, starting it off against David Cowan's 17th Indian Division near Tidham. The plan is to get the British to commit their reserves here so the main Japanese attack will face less opposition. The British know that the Japanese have been planning to attack, but they really underestimate how much force the Japanese plan to use. See, the British are well aware that any and all advances will be made over jungle tracks that supply vehicles cannot use. So that's why they think it'll be a smaller attack. The Japanese very much plan on capturing large quantities of enemy supplies for just this reason though. The British plan is for the 17th and 20th Indian divisions, currently in advanced positions, to fall back towards Impal to play defense. On the 9th though, when the news of the Japanese advance reaches Cowan's ears, at first, it's not believed. On the 10th, the Japanese attack the rear of 17th division's positions at Tongzang. Thing is, the British are flying Chindit forces this week into central Burma, and are starting to cut the Japanese communications between the forces advancing here and those facing Vinegar Joe Stilwell's Chinese and American forces. And while that's in your mind, I'm gonna backtrack and talk about the origins of this Japanese operation. And this will make sense in a minute. Okay, last February, British commander Ord Wingate launched the first Chindit operation. From their base at Impal, a few thousand men penetrated deep behind Japanese lines. Now, that operation had a high casualty rate, as we saw, and did not have a big military impact, but it did have a big impact on Mutaguchi, who took over the Japanese 15th Army last March, which came under command of Burma Area Army. Mutaguchi saw from that operation the worrying possibility of a similar but much larger attack in future, and he thought it should be preempted. He has the support of Subhas Chandra Bose and the INA, the Indian National Army, formed with Indian soldiers captured by the Japanese. Thousands of Indians have joined it since Bose took over the reins, and Bose figures that should there be a breakthrough into India, it will be welcomed by ordinary Indians. Eventually, all the lobbying for such an operation paid off, and in January, Tokyo authorized a preemptive strike against India with the taking of Impal as the primary objective. Interesting timing, because the British want to push into Burma from Impal. In fact, on the 5th, those British, Indian, and Gurkha forces I mentioned, the Chindits, fly in by glider behind Japanese lines in Burma. This is part of Wingate's second Chindit expedition, Operation Thursday. They land in a clearing more than 150 kilometers inside occupied Burma and nearly 500 from the nearest Allied supply base. 23 men are killed, but 400 make it in safely. More gliders arrive here at Broadway, the 6th, and there is another landing at Chowringhi across the Irrawaddy. The plan is to get as many as 9,000 men behind the lines by April, where they can hopefully join up with the Chindit Brigade that's been marching since early February, crossing mountains and rivers. There are a bunch of forces operating in that region, actually. For example, I mentioned a couple weeks ago that Merrill's Marauders, the 5307th Composite Unit, codenamed Galahad, were also on the march through the Burmese jungle. They were advancing to put up a roadblock in the Japanese rear at Walaobum, cutting the Japanese supply line using the Kamaeng Road. You may remember that Vinegar Joe Stilwell is in command of the American and Chinese forces operating around here. It is he who issued the orders for this. They were to assault the position and block the road until the Chinese could occupy the area and relieve them. This they managed to set up, but at the end of last week, Japanese attacks against them at Walaobum began. As this week begins, the fighting continues. Galahad does well, taking a few dozen casualties and killing upwards of 800 of the enemy, but Shinichi Tanaka's 18th Division vacates the premises. 
Tanaka decided to circumvent the 2nd Battalion's roadblock on the Kamaing Road by using a secret track that his engineers had very recently constructed in order to re-establish his forces further south. The roughly 12 and a half mile trail was constructed by Colonel Fukuyama of the Engineer Regiment on his own initiative as he became concerned about the reversals in the Japanese position at Walaobum. Tanaka issues the orders on the 5th, which turns out to be timely since Sun Li Jen's Chinese 113th Infantry Regiment, who had been following after Galahad, arrives the afternoon of the 6th. With the Chinese then taking over the area, Merrill orders his men to head south and recut the road further down there. Stilwell is angry that most of 18th Division gets away, but this is a big victory for a new China army over a top-notch Japanese division. Next week, Tanaka will dig in at the southern end of the Hukong Valley. It's the Allies who plan to soon dig in in Italy, but 5th Army will try one last push to break through or destroy the enemy at Monte Cassino first. The plan involves tons of air power to pulverize Cassino Town ahead of the armor and infantry heading in, the monastery already having been destroyed. Bernard Freiburg, who is to command the operation, wants this, as does Hap Arnold, U.S. Army Air Force's chief. Ira Eaker, who commands air power locally, is not so sure. A study by the Air Forces says that if they do bomb, then because of debris and cratering, it will be like 48 hours before any tanks can enter the town. Eaker, who is a believer in defeating the Axis by bombing campaigns, nevertheless writes to Arnold now on the 6th, do not set your heart on a great victory as a result of this operation. Personally, I do not feel it will throw the German out of his present position completely and entirely, or compel him to abandon the defensive role. Adding that if they do a huge bombing campaign and do not or, or cannot send in armor immediately afterwards, little useful purpose is served. Still, Freiburg's operation is a go. In the absence of a plausible alternative, after bombers flatten the town, the 2nd New Zealand Division with help from Indian troops and American tanks, would occupy the ruins and forge a bridgehead across the Rapido, while Indian troops seized Monte Cassino and opened the Leary Valley for armored forces. The scheme was codenamed Operation Dickens in honor of Charles Dickens, who after visiting Monte Cassino had written a lugubrious account. Freiburg wants three straight days of good weather before the operation so the ground is dry enough for tanks to cross. but. In February, rain started falling day after day after day, and morale has become a real issue, affected not only by the weather and the dreary war of attrition, but also by command. Last week, 2nd New Zealand Division Commander Howard Kippenberger stepped on a landmine and lost both feet, and 4th Indian Division Commander Francis Tucker has been sick for over a month now and is incapable of command. So that's Freiburg now, Without two of his best leaders, more on all of this as it develops. 4. This week of the war is nearing its end. And the longest week so far of the whole war in terms of script size anyhow. With the Japanese aiming for India, and the British aiming for Burma, the Soviets smashing through the enemy in Ukraine, fighting on Bougainville, fighting on Los Negros. Oh, and on the 10th, with Operation Margarete, the German occupation of Hungary soon to begin, Adolf Eichmann and his gang meet at Mauthausen camp to figure out a program to deport some 750,000 Jews from Hungary to Auschwitz. And already the 7th, Hermann Fertsch, who is to run that military operation, suggests March 18th as D-Day to high command. They decide though on the Sunday, the 19th. On the 18th, he sets up his headquarters in Vienna. And unlike most episodes where I end with a conclusion, I will end today with a beginning. We have a whole special episode coming out this month about the Finnish situation in general, because it's too much for the regular episodes. So watch for that. But for the past weeks, the Finns and Soviets have been conducting secret talks in Stockholm about Finland's future, i.e. Will they pull out of the war? The Soviet terms began to leak and then were published back on February 28th. And these were their demands. One, 
internment of German 20th Mountain Army, either by the Finns or with Soviet help. Two, restoration of the 1940 border. Three, return to the USSR of all military and civilian prisoners. Four, demobilization of the Finnish army, negotiations to determine whether partial or total. Five, reparations, but to be determined later. Six, ownership of Pechenga to be also negotiated. Thing is, the Soviets say that numbers two and three, the border and the prisoners issues, must be done before there can be any armistice. This week on the 8th, the Finns write that that is not acceptable as armistice preconditions. They also say interning the 20th Mountain Army is an impossibility. The Soviets reject this the 10th and set the 18th as the date for the final reply. If the Finns accept, what does that mean? If the Finns refuse, what does that mean? Well, the 18th is but seven days away. But for each of those seven days, you can still get content from us by following us on Instagram. Our content is able to exist thanks to the Time Ghost Army. And we are making something amazing together. And you too can join the army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. These are the newest commissioned officers in the army. And the army member of the week is Jeffrey Moots. If you want to see an episode about India and other British colonial possessions, check out this Between Two Wars episode we did the other year right here. Do not forget to subscribe. See you next time.